Well, the, um, there has been the Occupy movement, as I said in that talk, in fact, is quite unprecedented. I can't think of anything analogous to it. Uh, but these are quite unprecedented times. Uh, we are now in the uh, beyond the 30th year of a very sharp change in American history. If you take a look at American history since the beginning, I mean, there were various ups and downs, and it wasn't very pretty in a lot of ways, but there was a rather steady tendency towards growth, development, industrialization, mm -hmm. a sense of hope for the future. Uh, and that was true even in really dark times. I mean, I'm old enough to remember the Depression, and uh, my family were mostly working class, mostly unemployed. And objectively, it was a lot worse than it is now, but subjectively, it was different. There was a sense of hope. CIO was organizing, there were sit-down strikes, uh, the uh, WPA was giving uh, uh, occupations, uh, there were there was worker education. Uh, I mean, my unemployed relatives, some of whom never got past fourth grade, were uh, in, uh, uh, going to Shakespeare plays. You know, they had a high culture. The union, my uh, uh, aunts, seamstresses, unemployed seamstresses, were in Hillwood. You know that. Mm -hmm. And so they, it was a, it was a world. It was a life. You know? Yeah. And a, a community, a week in the country, a, you know, something to do. There was a sense that we're in it together, we're going to get out of it. That's just not true now. Um, for the last 30 years, there's, when it started in the 70s, there was a sharp change in the economy, conscious change, uh, towards uh, deindustrialization of the country. I mean, in, uh, industrial production can, continues, so you know, the Apple computer still continues, but at Foxconn. Right. Uh, so when you buy an Apple computer, you're buying something where the parts, the components, the uh, a lot of development comes from Japan, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, and it's assembled in China uh, with very little value added, incidentally, under horrendous working conditions. And then you buy it here, and the profits go back to Apple. And it's the same across the industrial system. So by now, uh, you know, in manufacturing, a real unemployment is about the level of depression, but uh, with a big difference. In the late 30s, you had a sense that it's going to come back, that we're going to get it back, you know, we can do it. And now the, the sense of um, working people with some justification is that unless policy changes sharply, we're not going to get it back. It's over. And there's a general sense of malaise in the country. Uh, sort of, they see it the same as true in attitude towards institutions. like. Congress you know, might as well disappear, everybody hates them. And the same is true of just about every other institution. Uh, there's a, 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 and it's objective. I mean, for the roughly 30 years, uh, uh, real incomes have barely grown for most of the, pretty much stagnated for most of the population. For a tiny sector, I mean, so small it's not even picked up in the census. But there has just been spectacular wealth. It's actually about a tenth of one percent. That's, uh, and that reflects the other major change in the economy, along with the deindustrialization, conscious deindustrialization of the country, came uh, financialization. So investors could make more money playing ridiculous games with uh, the, uh, the speculation and so on. You know, can you make this? other guy out by a second in the trade, you know. Uh, and the financial sector grew enormously. By, by 2007, before the latest crash, it was about 40% of corporate profits. And it doesn't do anything for the economy, in fact, probably harms it. Uh, but it does create enormous, highly concentrated wealth. Also draws plenty of talent away from other things. Mm -hmm. So take, say, my own university, MIT, Science University. There's a great math department, but a large part of the math department is now devoted to financial mathematics, which is just a waste to undermine the economy with uh, various kinds of trickery. And that's not only harming society, but it's also drawing away talent that could be used for you know, developing uh, advanced uh, uh, engineering and uh, uh, production for the things that people need. And the society's not going to survive if it doesn't produce things people need. You know, it can go on on the basis of uh, 
at Hersher for a long time, but it's a self-inflicted decline. And for the population, you've got this tremendous gap between uh, stagnation, malaise, uh, lack of hope for the future, and uh, fantastic wealth. I, mean, I remember a couple of weeks ago there was a front page story, and the front page of the New York Times had two stories. Uh, one of them was about uh, the growth and the poverty rate, you know, the, uh, the disillusionment, the lack of hope that people can't buy what they need, they have to go to food bank. Mm -hmm. Right next to it was a story about how in luxury stores they're raising prices because it doesn't matter how much you raise the prices, people are going to buy it anyway. So, uh, and, and that's the country. Well, out of this, the, the Occupy movement is actually the first organized large-scale protest directed to the whole set of problems. Now, Wisconsin was very important, but that was specific. It was due to the uh, efforts of the government to try to destroy the last remnants of uh, working-class organization, and that was very impressive mobilization against that. But the Occupy movement is a, a, its kind of across the board. It's go after the whole range of issues that is destroying the society. And in that respect, it's uh, very hopeful and uh, kind of inspiring that people who are involved are putting themselves in the line. Uh, not a lot of fun to sleep in the park uh, mm -hmm. day after day. And they've also developed uh, uh, communities. Um, there's a, a sense of solidarity that's been reemerged. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was always the core of the labor movement. Solidarity wasn't just a slogan. It meant you're working together. You know, we're part of broader society. And that's being rebuilt within these movements, and it's uh, it, it, it's quite significant, I think. They're setting up kind of bonds, associations, learning how to do things together, community kitchens, uh, health centers, libraries, and well, that's the positive side. Mm -hmm. uh, the it's of course, uh, power never says goodbye. Yeah, thanks. Take it away from me. <laughs> uh, it's it's going to fight back. And, uh, it's, and uh, we happen to have, you look at U.S. history, it's, a, it's different than European countries for a lot of reasons, uh, but it has a highly class-conscious business community, uh, always fighting a bitter class war, very conscious about it. You read the business literature, it reads like uh, the, the Red Mouse Red Book with the values of her. You know, you got to fight the uh, everlasting battle to win the minds of men and uh, overcome the uh, organization of the masses, which is a threat to you know, power. I mean, it's uh, and, they, and, and uh, 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 in fact, the 70s, the shift in the 70s came from organized efforts to respond to the dangerous uh, democratizing tendencies of the 1960s. That was pretty explicit. I uh, could talk about it, but anyway, it's explicit plan. And now that uh, this movement is developing, the backlash is, of course, developing along with it. And there's going to be barriers. You don't win things quickly. It takes a long time. I mean, say, civil rights movement, you know, it didn't begin when Martin Luther King made a speech. You know. In fact, it started in the 30s. And a lot of long struggle, fairly, you know, 1960, it, kids sitting in a lunch counter, with Freedom Riders, or, and then, uh, finally a big movement developed, but it's interesting to you learn a lot about the United States by seeing what happened to it. That as long as Martin Luther King was talking about racist Alabama sheriffs, he was popular among, you know, relatively popular among elites. As soon as he began shifting to class issues, yes. he was kill, killed off. I mean, you listen to the speeches on Martin Luther King Day about how great he was, it typically ends with, I had a dream, not with, I'm organizing a poor people's movement, or I'm going to Memphis for a sanitation strike, where he's assassinated. And, uh, and that reflects the, you know, the deep-seated ideolo elite ideology that the only thing that matters is the rich and the powerful, and the rest are sort of in the way. You know. Uh, of course, it's not the way the population thinks about it, but it's uh, it's the way power sees itself. I mean, it's the media and so on and so forth. So there, yes, there's, there's, it's going to be a long, hard struggle. You can't just 
sit in a park <coughs> or right. you have to reach out to the community, you have to organize other groups. Uh, uh, there was a poll that was just reported today saying that about half the population doesn't understand what mm -hmm. uh, the Occupy movement's about. Well, try to overcome that.